is in this scope. Well, after this for loop finishes, what is going to be the value of i in this scope? Ten. Let's get this. After the for loop completes, i starts off at zero, right? Then it loops and loops and loops and loops until it gets to ten and then exits, right? If it's nine, it's going to go in. If it's ten, it exits. So it gets to ten and exits. So the value of i in this scope is ten. And so when this finally executes, it's going to read that i. 10, 10, 10. And now each of these is going to execute dum 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 and execute and console 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. This much. Mm -hmm. I'll send you. Check. I'll send you. Wait, wait. Okay. So, so the criticism was uh, he thinks it might be nine. Well, let me just explain to you why it's not. It's actually ten. So, i begins with zero, right? You agree? So when i is 0, does it go into the for loop? Yes, right? When 1, yes. 2, yes. Ba, 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 ba. When it's 9, does it go into the for loop? Yes. 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 Then it comes here and it increments. It becomes 10. And now when it's 10 is less than, is 10 less than 10? No. That is what fails it and drops it. And so by the time i gets to here, i actually has a value of 10. Because 10 is the only thing that can make this or by the time it gets to 10, that's what makes this expression false, and it exits the for loop. So in reality, you're right. Within this for loop, it can never be more than 9. But once it finishes the loop, outside of the loop, it's actually one more than that. It's the, it's the failure expression. It's 10. And up to This one. Is the failure for Make, remember, threads cannot be interrupted, right? So as long as this is looping, right? This thing cannot wake up and say, stop, I have to run. There's no such thing. That's an interrupt, right? There are, so whenever an algorithm is running, you can never say, stop, this is going to run. Unless you explicitly set a timeout yourself. This one says, make up. Right, so set timeout will always put it in the queue, right? But the moment it gets into a queue, it's think of it as a separate algorithm, okay? And a separate algorithm can never interrupt this algorithm. By the way, you can either put zero or you can just not put anything here at all. You can just close it and be done. It's the same thing as putting zero. <coughs> so all you're saying there, if you were to just make the zero, is wait at least zero, at least. Remember, this is the important part. It's the minimum value. It's not the value. It's the minimum value. Wait at least zero before you run. But it can't wait zero because there's another algorithm running. So it has to wait for that algorithm to complete, and then it can go over the queue and start executing. So the interview question that will... So the next question that people will ask is, okay, given this problem, suppose instead of set timeout, I'm doing an Ajax call. I'm calling Google Maps, I'm calling whatever, to get some data from a server, and it's coming back and I want to do some processing. Um, but the index is now 10 for all of them, so I've lost track of where I am in my array. Let's say I'm iterating over some array. What can we do to make it so that this will actually print what we want it to print, which is 0 through 9? Can anyone tell me? How can I modify this? Exactly. Send it as a... Yeah, exactly. Okay, so what we can do is we can, for example, create a separate function, var func, which takes as an argument a value, which let's just call it i. Put that in there. So now i, what, the scope of i is now within this. You're no longer referring to the global i, you're referring to the local i, which is this, right? So now what we do is we call that, we can just do this. Set timeout takes a function. Well, so let's do, wait a minute. No, that's set timeout. No, no, no. Okay. So let's put this timeout inside of that. Sorry. Also. Mm -hmm. And here, all we do is we call pump with the i. And now we get what we want. Again, why? It's very simple. Because here, this is, 
I that is a global, right? But the moment we pass I here, I within this scope is local, right? So I, the first time I call it, is getting zero. Second time I call it is getting one. And so when this actual function actually runs, it's not going to use the global I, it's going to use this I. You guys get this? I see some blank faces, I'm not sure. This is actually, guys, this is a bug I've seen time and time again. And it's an interview question I've been asked and asked myself time and time again. So if you guys want to work in this industry, you have to understand this. So again, who doesn't understand this? I'm happy to explain it again. John, okay, yep. Everyone understands it. Perfect. Okay, so let's go back to Angular. So, okay. Welcome everyone, welcome back from, this is almost August, not quite. Um, sorry for the delay, I had to go to Dijon for a week to, to do some stuff there. Dijon? Not yet. Not yet. Um, Alright, so last time we were discussing MVC frameworks, right? So model view controller frameworks. We discussed Backbone, we discussed Knockout, and we began discussing Angular. And one of the main things that we discussed was how to perform data binding, specifically two-way data binding. So this is where you have some data here, and you have your view here, and you want to keep the two in sync. So you want to draw the stuff that's here in here, but if something changes here, you want to update it here, and vice versa. Okay? So keeping the two in sync, the model and the view in sync. Now, we discussed that browsers had no facility to raise events when objects were modified. So, lots of libraries did lots of craziness, like Backbone made this wrapper model that tried to wrap an object, and so all changes went through the model, and therefore it could raise the appropriate events when things were modified. Knockout asked you to wrap each individual value with an observable, so that when modified, the observable would then raise an event and say, oh, something has been changed, and you could perform your tasks. Angular did something different. Angular instead did a dip or dirty checking. It had a digestion cycle that we discussed, where, where when things were modified, it would go through the cycle where it would check to see what has changed and then call the appropriate watch expressions and sort of cycle through until uh, the, the dirty bits were, were complete. All of this work, all of this crazy, weird workarounds were all because we didn't have a native mechanism to listen to events in, in, the, in the JavaScript objects. I'm happy to say that we now do. Chrome, the first browser, and I think right now the only browser, now officially supports object.observe. Object.observe will allow you to observe changes for any object, right? So any property that changes within any object, you can listen to it natively without wrapping it with an observable or with a backbone model or any of this weirdness. This actually puts Angular in a very good position. So I told you guys that I'm just giving you the information about the frameworks. I'm not telling you which one to use. But keep this one in mind. So Angular right now does the digestion with dirty checking, right? But if you think about it, Angular doesn't force you to do any wrapping. So as far as the public API is concerned, you don't have to worry about any wrappers. All you do is you have a scope and you attach objects to that scope, right? That means that Angular can change the, the code inside to instead of doing dirty checking, to instead use object.observe, the native functionality, and you as a programmer would never even know. Whereas all the other libraries, if they decided to use object.observe, they would have to change like 90% of their code. Right? Because think about it, knockout, it's all about these observables. Backbone, it's all about these models that are wrapping your objects, right? So if you remove that because you don't need it anymore, suddenly those libraries are kind of obsolete. Angular, on the other hand, abstracts the, the dirty checking away from you, and so you only have to do is update the code, and it will now perform that much faster with native functionality. And in fact, this is exactly what they want to do. So in the future versions of Angular, I believe the projection is Ang Angular version 2, they're going to have native support. They are actually going to use object.observe which will make Angular way faster than it is now, right? Much, much faster. 
it will be very performant. In fact, it will be faster than Knockout, Backbone, and any other library out there because it will use native functionality rather than trying to wrap it with its own functions. So this is really exciting news, right? And it's coming. Um, but you, if you use Angular, will get the benefit without even knowing it because they will just update the code and your code will just be faster, which is always a great thing. Right? Okay, so last time we discussed uh, data binding, right? So we talked about scope, um, that you know, uh, you have controllers that get a scope and you can attach objects to that scope and then you can bind to values within that scope. Fair enough. So today we're going to keep going. Specifically, we're going to talk about filters, directives, some routing, uh, maybe a few other things, and then if we have time, we'll discuss um, maybe required JS or something. Lots of material. We always have something to talk about. Okay, so filters. What are filters? So let's do a very quick review of what Angular uh, apps can look like. Can everyone read the code? Even the people in the back. Can you read this? Yes. Okay. Cool. So typically, what you will have is you will have some handler to your root application. In this case, the handler is an ID, which I referenced as main. And then you have a div, and within that div, you specify a controller. Now, a controller is the thing that controls the content within that scope. Okay? So what, you're, what I'm saying here is that the stuff between this uh, is controlled by this controller. And so this data, all these things that are going to be here, are going to read from the scope that is controlled by that controller. So, how do we set up our code? Well, obviously we have to, we have to uh, load Angular, so we just use a script tag and Angular comes in, no problem. We like to wrap everything with a closure or a function. Why do we wrap everything with a function? To make it So, to avoid leaking global variables, right? So that if I do something like bar a is one or two, that will not become global. If on the other hand, if I were to put this here, A is now global, right? Bad, bad, bad thing. So always wrap your stuff in, in a function, in a closure. Okay, so that's all this is doing. Well, that's all this and that is doing is just wrapping things in a function so we don't leak into the global scope. Okay, what's the next thing we do? Next thing we want to do is we want to create a module. Now, again, in Angular, just to remind you guys, a module is just a place where you put code that has similar functionality. That's it. Okay, that's all a module is. In this case, our module is going to be our demo module. Okay, so you give it a name. You can also give it an array of dependent modules. So these are modules that you might have imported externally that you want to use in your product. Okay. Then we're going to add. Let's skip this one for a moment. We're going to add a controller. Demo dot controller. Let me get rid of the debugger stick. I want to show you guys how to debug. Most of you know. Okay. So here I register a controller. I give it the name and then the function, which is the thing that actually does the controller. Okay? What I say is dollar scope, which is the thing that I'm going to attach my data to, my model to, right? And then to that I do dot data and I reference an array which has dog, cat, and fish. So, okay, fair enough. So then here I can, if I go up here, um, I can ng bind data, and what I should get is dog, cat, and fish, if you guys remember. ng bind is the read only version of data bind. Remember, there's ng model that you use for editing, and then there's ng bind that you use for just reading. Right? Okay, so here we're saying ng bind data. Now, what is data? Do you guys remember? It's an array. So, in order for it to print here, what does it do to that array? Exactly. In order to print something, whether it's doing console login or whatever, you are converting it into a string. Whenever you're converting an object into a string, you're effectively calling the toString function. And the toString function in array, again, to remind you guys, will iterate over each value within the array, calling toString on each of those values, and then putting a comma in between. Now the two string of string of dog, the string dog is dog. It doesn't really need a two string, right? Cat and fish. And so what we get is dog, cat, and fish. No problem. 
right? Okay. But then we add what's known as a filter. The syntax for a filter is putting this pipe and then the name of the filter. We define a filter similarly to the way we define controllers in that we do demo dot filter the name of the thing and the function that performs the action. Notice the pattern is very similar, right? You say what you want, the name of the thing, and the function that will perform the action. Okay? Okay, so what does this filter do? Well, specifically with this filter, it's going to return a function. And what that function is going to do, let me get rid of remove value. Sorry. That's extra, we don't need this. Is it will take as input the res this, the result of this will get passed to the function that is returned here. So data, which if you recall is an array, will get passed to this function as that. And now what we can do is we can transform that array. We can change that array. We can modify that array. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm doing uh, array.filter. For those of you who may not know this, arrays in modern browsers have a filter function. And what filter will do is you give it a function, it will call your function for every value within this array. And if you return true, it will keep it. If you return false, it will throw it away. And that, and it will return the new modified array back out. Okay, so this will return the modified array. It doesn't modify the existing array, it just returns the new array. Okay? Okay, so what does this do? Well, it removes the only thing that doesn't make sense. So dog and cat kind of go together. Fish is a little weird, right? It's not a mammal. So we're going to get rid of fish. So anything that is not a fish, this will return, um, so this will return uh, tr um, true for dog, true for cat, false for fish, right? So the result that will get returned will be an array that will consist of everything except fish. So what I've effectively done is I've taken an array with dog, cat, and fish, and I'm returning an array with just dog and cat. And so the result of this expression is dog and cat. So what are filters now? Well, what filters are, they're transforms. They're what allow you to take existing data and either limit the content or modify the content or completely transform the content or even add additional content to it before it is actually returned. It's effectively a post-processor. Okay? So you have your data and then you do some processing before you render it. Okay? Why would you have something like this? Well, the reason why you might have something like this, for example, is you want to keep your data nice and clean. You want to, in your data, still have dog, cat, and fish. It's only when you render it, let's say in this specific element, that you want to modify it a little bit. In that case, it doesn't make sense to actually modify the existing model. All you want to do is just modify the stuff that happens here. In that case, it might make sense to add a filter. And a filter is typically reusable. Because once you've registered it, you can use it to filter other things. It doesn't just have to be data. It can be other arrays that you pass in. And it will remove everything except fish. Sorry, keep everything except fish. Okay? So if you, have, if you hate fish, that's the filter for you. Um, right, so there is a, so Angular actually gives you some filters for free. That it, that it already is part of the library. And one of those that I love for debugging is a filter called JSON. What do you guys think JSON does? Can anyone venture a guess? What is JSON? Yeah, it's a stringified version, effectively. It's a serialized version of JavaScript objects, right? That's what, basically what JSON is. So what it will do is it will take the data you give it and convert it into a JSON string and print it. That is hugely useful for debugging. So if I go here, let's, instead of mammals, let's use JSON. Let's go here, instead of data, because the JSON for this array is not that interesting, let's put in some complicated object, which has you know, foo, which has a bar, which maybe has a zoo with a yay, right? And then we come here and look at this. Now, just to show you just how cool this is, 
let me actually put in a modifier. So let me put in an input. Input um, type oh, text. Then we're going to do, how do I modify stuff? Model, that's right, model. And what we want to do is let's just modify, uh, where's, let's modify zoo. How do I modify zoo? What do I have to type to modify zoo? Yeah, so, uh, wait, I'm going to, yeah, yeah, this is right. Okay, so I do data dot the foo dot bar dot zoo. Now watch this, ready? Woo! You guys get the power? So what you can do, and I do this all the time, is when I build some big complicated user interface, is I will take the root of that object, or of the scope that I'm working in within here, let's say I'm writing a directive or whatever, and I will actually bind that data and pass it through the JSON filter and have it just print down here. And now, as things are changing here, I can always look down there and see exactly what my data looks like because it's printed in JSON just underneath. Do you guys see this? What's that? Oh, uh, essay was made. Pipe, JSON. That is the name of the filter, okay? Same syntax, right? So you can either write your own custom filters and put them here, or you can use existing filters and put them here. All right, this one. Yes, absolutely. So, right, so we were, I was going to get to that. But right. So the cool part about this is, so the output of this is typed into the input of this, right? The output of this can then be piped into another filter, which can be piped into another filter. So you can keep going through several transforms until you come out the other side. Yes, sir. You can. Yeah. Great question. This one. Uh, yeah, then, yeah, exactly. You would just do a two string on the object. So, so if you were to just print the data, what is data? It's an object, and the two string of that is object object, right? Mm -hmm. Object being the function constructor that created, <laughs> or the name of the function constructor that was used to create the object. If you guys remember that. Okay. So, okay, cool. So we have these filters that allow us to transform the data. What else can we do? We can actually pass arguments. So remember before, in the previous one, I had hard-coded fish as the thing that determines which values are saved and which values are returned, right? So this is a hard-coded string. Right? In this example, I'm going to use a variable instead. So what you can do is, you can, this is the same exact example, same example, except here, instead of, uh, doing not equal to the string fish, I'm doing not equal to a variable, okay? And that variable is passed in with the following syntax. So you do the name of the, of the filter, colon, the variable. And then you can do colon, next variable, colon, next variable, and you can pass in arbitrary number of variables you like. Make sense? Cool. So let's do, let's tell you what, let's do this, and let's do uh, the zero index of that array. Dump cache. You understand what I did? So the question was, can we put arrays within this expression? Yes, you can. So this, so I should tell you guys, by the way, you guys notice that some of this kind of looks like JavaScript, but some of it does not. It's a little, it's a weird combination of sort of JavaScript, but not JavaScript. And so Angular kind of, has this thing where they've taken a subset of JavaScript, but then they added or decorated it with some additional expressions. Um, and they also, there are expressions that they don't allow you to do. Okay? So they've taken a subset of JavaScript that they allow you to use, but nothing outside of that. And kind of understanding where that line is, where that dividing line is between what you can do and can't do, is kind of something you have to just work with. Just trial and error. Just try something. If it doesn't work, assume they don't allow it. That's my approach. Or try to read their horrible documentation. Good luck. Okay. Um, questions? 
question? No questions. All right. Cool. Uh, oh, right. So, uh, what did I want to show you here? All right. So, what I want to say is you can also do like call uh, JSON. So, you could do something like that too. That's fine. See, that, that is the JSON version of an array. Right? So, what I, did, what I did is I took this data, passed it through this filter, and then passed it through that filter. Right? If I were to not pass it through that filter, I would just get the original dog catfish. You guys get that? So you can chain an arbitrary number of filters together and get some cool output. Okay, you guys get that. Good. Uh, okay. Ah, so one of the so I mentioned to you the JSON filter, which is a filter that you get for free from Angular because it's part of the library, right? It just says here you go. Good luck. There's another very common filter that is given to you, and that is called a filter. Original name, I know. But it actually, it, it's, but it makes sense because that's actually what it does. Um, so how does this work? Well, first let me show you the demo. So I have a table. So these are the table headings, and then this is the contents, table rows, uh, where I have, you know, the name and the phone number. And I can do something like, So what am I doing here? What I effectively did was create a very basic filter that allows me to, by typing stuff here, search for names that match that string and only filter this content down to only stuff that matches the name. Makes sense, right? Okay, so how can we do this? Well, we could write our own custom filter, but because there's already this filter out there, let's see how we can use it. We can leverage existing code. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to have, so forget the input for a second, ng repeat, which loops over friends. Now friends is just an array with a bunch of objects. Each one has a name and a phone number, okay? And you have a bunch of these. So then what we're going to do is we're going to do a um, uh, ng repeat. So we're going to repeat the cycle for each one of those values, each one of our friends. And what we're going to do is, for each one, we're then going to print the name <coughs> and the phone number for each object that we're looping over. Okay? So this is, again, using the ng repeat construct that we learned last time. For those of you who weren't here, uh, this would just, this means repeat, repeat this block for every one of these. Okay? That's all this is saying. Okay? It, repeat this template for every one of these. And what we're saying is friend object in friend. So friend object is a reference to the individual object within this cycle. And so for each one, we can get the name and the phone number and print it. That part is okay, right? Anyone have questions about this? You guys get it. Okay, good. Okay, so once we have that, we then do a pipe, which then passes the result of this into filtering. Right? Okay? So we're basically filtering friends. Think of it this way, though. It's not the result of the iteration. It's the result of that, and then the result of that is what we're iterating over. You guys get that? Okay. So we filter the friends first, and then we iterate over it. Okay. Okay, good. So um, what is our filter doing? So we're calling filter, which is the name of the filter. Okay. What does this do? Do you remember? Argument. argument. That's right. So here we're passing an argument to filter, which is that, and we'll see what that is in a second. And then we're passing a second argument of false. We'll discuss that as well. Okay, so we're passing filter two arguments. No problem, right? And then filter does something to friends, and then the result of that is iterated over and we print the list. Okay? Okay, so what is search? Well, Watch this. Inside here, we have an input box that is going to modify search.name. Does this object exist? Do you see search anywhere in my controller? No, right? It doesn't exist. So what happens? Well, what happens is when you modify this input, it says, oh, I have to write something for name which is attached to search, does search exist? So it creates it. Okay. So it will actually create an object called search, attach it to the local scope, 
and then do dot name on it, and then write the result of whatever we type into that value. Okay? So it's creation on write. It will create it when we write. Before then, it does not exist. So what we have then within our scope is an object search that has a name value of whatever we type. And then we have a friends array that has all those objects that each of which had a name. Okay, let me say this again. We have an object that has a name which has the value that I typed in. And then we have a friends array which has objects each of which has a name. You guys see the connection? It's trying to match this object, this object, with the values within friends. How? Well, it's saying, what are the attributes of search? Well, it has a name. So it tries to match the name attribute of the object with each name attribute of the objects inside of friends. This one? Okay, right. don't knock out, but we'll get to that in a second. So you can do, uh, you can, let's, let's change this to phone. Let's have, yeah, so now it will match phone numbers. So here if we do, watch, if I do whatever, J, there are no phone numbers that have J. How's that going? I just may not get you, so much food is found out. Oh, wait. Okay, so now, instead of writing, let's say I want to search across both name and phone. Um, so I don't know if there's a facility to say just name and phone and nothing else, but I do know that they have a facility called dollar, like that, which allows you to search for Mary, John, and phone number. So dollar is kind of, it's, it's like an extra wild flag, basically. Uh, it's not a wild flag, it's, um, I don't know what you call it. It's the value that will apply to everything. It's a magic value, okay? So whatever you put in here, it will try to match that against any value that's inside of the objects that we're iterating over. Can you put in your expression first? Ah, here. Can you put a regular expression here for it to move? Uh, I don't know. I have never tried. It's a good question. I don't know. We need to read the documentation to find out. This one answers. Atame yekusu by the voice and manal sata. Huh? That's. I had to get that. Atas don chanta sa. Okay, so the question was, suppose you just wanted, let's say you had these objects, they didn't just have name and phone number, but they have name, phone number, description, image, like 50 other things. And the question is, how do I search for just across name and phone, but not across the rest of the stuff? Is that the right question, sir? John. Um, I, I don't know if there is a way to do that. If there, do you guys know of a way? Anyone here? Okay, good. It's not just me. Um, <laughs> One way to get around this, though, is you could write your own custom filter, the way I showed you before with mammals. You could do the filter at Arwen Gerek. What are concrete and you can do a filter on it. How much time? It's a bit of a filter. But if you want to do before that, make sure you read the documentation to make sure this doesn't support that before you go in. Right. But I don't know it, I'm sorry. Yes, sir? Oh, good question. Uh, wait, no, 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 wait, no. Uh, wait, no. This, the, okay. Yeah, no. As object, as object, in the scope in Kapata, in the scope of Chi. And if you have a Kapata or scope in Chi, you can't remember what you did, whatever you said, JSON, JSON's head. 
բոլոր օբյեկտները, որ մենք ցում ենք JSON-ը JSON-ից հետ, պետք է proto reference-ը չունենա, չէ, որտե բարի կգիտան, հենց գնանք կա։ Ճիշտ է։ Ա ժամար ենթադրում ենք, որ data-ն ինքը այդ այս խնդիրն է չունի։ Իմ պատասխաններ ենթադրում են, որ երևի չի է գնում, որտեղ ենթադրում են, որ չպտի որ գնա, չպտի ունենա։ Այն ինչ որ դուք եք ասում, այդ որ scope-ը ունեն իրար իրար մեջ կա proto reference, չէ, այդ է ծրանցը։ Բայց այդ ժամանը, բայց Ես էս սկոպը չի, էս սկոպի վրայից կախված դիտանը։ Ասկան մեկ ինչ եմ ասում։ Սկոպը ինքը ոբջեկտա չէ է, որը որ ունի պրորորակնց, բայց ինքը հետո հաղումա միատ ուրիշ ոբջեկտին, որ մեկ ենք կնցրեն պետք է հեշտ լինի սրելայսմը ու նան սրելայսմը, ոկա։ Ասկանք, 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 ամար ու պատասխաններ չէ գիտեմ, որտը ոչ որտի անում, աչ գիտված այս այս։ Ոկե, so very quickly the question was, well, what about inheritance? Will this iteration check for inherited proto-references? And the answer is, don't do inheritance in your data. Because if you do inheritance in your data, if you have proto-references to other objects, when you serialize them into JSON, which you commonly do when you're communicating with the server, and then bring it back, you lose all of those references anyway. So keep your data separate. If you want to do prototypal inheritance, do that separately from your data. Don't mix them. Questions? No questions? Okay, cool. By the way, if I go over 11, let me know. Oh, we have 15 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's keep... Oh, by the way, look at this. Mm. Ah, let's say we wanted to... Okay, here's a good one. Let's say I wanted to debug this. Ah. What can I do? So here's what I do. Again, I'll say this again. What I can do is something like this. What does this do, guys? Oh, wait, I didn't tell you what false is. False makes it strict. So you have to type in the exact string for it to match. Otherwise, it will... Remember before, I was just typing in MA, and it was matching like Mary, Linda, Mark, and all these. Strict, in other words, true, means match only if it's Mark. Okay? That's all that is. It's strict matching. False, I usually use false. Okay, so watch what I'm doing here. So here's where I'm actually doing my data binding and rendering of elements and so on, right? Here, I'm, doing, I'm binding from the exact same kind of thing, but I'm filtering it through JSON. So here I'm doing ng-bind friends, which I'm running through this filter, the same filter that I'm running through here. The same filter. Type JSON. So now what happens is, down here I get this JSON, right? And if I type in, say, uh, Joe, see that? It filters this, but it also filters this, because it's the same mechanism. And so while here I see the rendered version, here I see the actual data that's coming in, and I can better understand what's happening in my code. This one. False. With a strict G. If a strict DNA, true. That's kind of good. Answer good? Cool. No questions. Okay, dependency injection. This sounds scary. It's actually the easiest thing in the world. All right. What is dependency injection? So, guys, up until this point, right, I've been telling you that you can create a module, do dot controller, specify a name for your controller, give it a function which magically just takes the scope object and then attach things to the scope. Right? The question is, how does Angular know to give you a scope object? In fact, how does Angular know to give you other things that you might request? So here's the interesting part. The way you request things from Angular is by just listing them in your function. What do I mean by this? Well, just like you can register a controller, you can also register a value. This is basically to avoid like legal, creating very global or variables that are global to your application. Instead, you register a value, you give it a name, and you give it the value you want. And then what you can do is you can request this value from within your controller. How do you request it? By name. So you have this name and that name are the same? 
All you have to do is write the name, and it magically will take 23 and pass it here and give it to you. Okay, cool. So any, anything that you register here, you, not anything, but certain of things that you register here, we'll talk about, maybe we'll talk about factories and stuff later, services. Um, you can then inject into here by just giving the name, and Angular will figure out what you need and give it to you. So let me ask you this. How does Angular know what you're requesting? Suppose you're writing Angular, okay? Put yourself in the position of the programmer who's writing a library, okay? You get a function, okay? So let's, let's do this. Let's write Angular. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so let's, um, let's create a function. Angular, no, <coughs> eng, yeah. Okay. In fact, let's have this be the controller function. So the controller function takes what? The controller function takes a string and a function, right? So we're going to take the name and a function, okay? Okay, fine, so we have some internal data structure like called var my controllers, which is an object, and in that is where we will store by name the function that is given to us, right? So Angular internally has some registry where it registers by name the thing that you gave it. So that when you, in your code, you say my scope, it knows to then look it up into the data structure by that name and get the function to call within the scope. Right? Okay, fine. So now we need to figure out somehow when I call this function. So now let's just say later we have a var invoke method, which takes a name. Okay, so now I need to invoke the controller. I need to call the controller. And it gives me the name, so no problem. I can look up the name in my uh, controllers by name. Okay, now I have the func, right? Good, I got the func back. Now I need to call the func. <coughs> With me so far? Here you're registering the function, by right? You're giving the name and the function. I'm adding it to my internal hash table object, right? And then later you're saying, now call the function that has this name. So I look it up in my little internal map, return the function, and then call the function. But here's the trick. What do I pass as arguments to this function? How do I know what the arguments are? How can Angular know what the arguments are? Well, here's the trick that Angular uses. What happens if you do a toString on a function? Exactly. It prints the function. So watch this. Suppose, let me get rid of all this for a second. Suppose I have var func function which has a, b, c. Right? And then I do console.log func. Look at that. So the two string of a function prints the function. So now all we need to do is use regular expressions, which we learned about, right, to extract A, B, and C. To extract the arguments that are inside of these two prime parentheses. And once we do that, we can then read this name, read that name, and read this name, look it up in the internal data structure by name, get the value, and pass it in. Got the other. One more time. We take the function, we call toString on it. We get something like this. We use a regular expression to extract A, so the, the names of the arguments, which are A, B, and C. We use these names to look up in our internal registry for what is the value of this name. Right? We get that value and we inject it as arguments into the function when we call it. As you can imagine, there are a few problems with this. Can anyone name me one problem? How about performance? Imagine every time they have to do, figure this out, they have to do this thing where they do a two string, regex. Okay, now you might cache it, so you do it one time, but you're still doing like a two string and regular expression, you're doing extra work. But there's a bigger problem. There's a huge problem, actually. The problem is, suppose in my code, suppose this is my code, this is my code, okay? And instead of here, I do dollar, Scope, here I do uh, 
know, a dollar root uh, scope. I'm just making stuff up, and here I have foo. So I have this. Now Angular will do a two string on this, and then look up dollar scope and say, ah, root wants, dollar, wants scope for the first argument, and pass that. He parses this and goes, ah, he wants access to the root scope. Passes that. Ah, he wants foo, whatever the heck foo is. Figures it out, passes it in. No problem. The problem is, we're writing web applications that run in the browser, right? Well, when you write JavaScript for the browser, what's the, one of the things you do to increase performance or decrease the time in which it takes to download a file? Minimize. Exactly. You minimize. You run through your JavaScript code through a minimizer. And what does a minimizer do? Exactly. So it will then convert this into, or sorry, not even dollar A, just A, B, C. So, as you can imagine, this will break Angular because Angular doesn't know what A is. It has nothing in its registry called A. It has dollar scope, but not A, right? So the question is, how do you avoid these two problems? The second one being absolutely fundamental. So, here's how you do that. Instead of just passing a function as the second argument, you pass in an array. In this array, the first set of arguments are the names of the variables you want. Okay? So here I can do dollar $scope, and the second variable was my value, right? Now watch this. Suppose I now change dollar scope to be A. And A. See how it works? So what we're saying is that this is this. This is this. And now if this gets turned into something else, no problem. Because Angular is reading these values to understand what you want. Not trying to stringify and do regular expressions and guess what you meant. Okay? So if you want to build a quick prototype just to try something out, just doing a function is okay. But the moment you're thinking about production, production grade code, that's when you have to really stick to this kind of syntax. Otherwise later it will bite you in the... So don't do that. So always try to explicitly specify the names of your... It will run faster. Right? Because now it does not parse, it will just read this and done. And you won't incur the penalty of getting bugs from compression. Is that clear? Are you asking me if you can do this, or if you're telling me you can do this? Uh, I don't understand uh, how it uh, requires the end of this and uh, how it's end of the end of the So the thing is, I haven't covered require. We, you and I can talk about require later, but I feel like other people won't understand what we're talking about. So let's talk about it at, uh, offline, okay? You and I. Um, it's now, wait. One thing I want to show you guys very quickly before we move on. There's more. There's a lot more. But just very quickly before we move on. So there's this notion of a root scope. Okay? So here we understand that because we specified controller, that the stuff in here is relative to that scope, right? To the scope that's controlled by my scope. Right? But what happens outside of that? What happens above that? We're still inside of a scope. But that is known as a root scope. And you can actually request a reference to that root scope by specifying it as part of your parameters. So you can say dollar root scope, and then get dollar root scope here. Let me change this back to dollar scope so you don't get confused. Uh, this is dollar scope. Okay, good. Okay, now. Uh, Watch this. Dollar scope lives, when it's executed, lives here, right? 
the root, the root scope or the global scope is just above it. So it's, in this context, the parent of that scope, right? So what that means is that I can do dollar scope dot, dot dollar parent and compare that to dollar root scope. And let me alert that so you guys see it. True. Okay. So what that means is that the parent of the parent of my local scope is the global scope. Does that make sense? Now watch this. Uh -huh. Let me mod modify what root scope is. Let me add to root scope. Dollar root scope dot foo is yay, right? And now in here, foo, right? In here where I'm rendering name, let me render who. There you go. Okay, so uh, watch this, guys. So I'm with this scope, I'm within this scope, right? Which has name attached to it, there it is. But then suddenly I reference foo, and I get this value, yay. Huh? That's weird. Yeah, why, how? You know how? It won't sound about something. Okay, so here's what happens. What happens is, let me tell you what happens, and then you tell me how. Okay, I'll explain it again. So within this scope, this scope is bound to an object, or there's an object hanging. There are lots of objects hanging from the scope. The scope itself is an object. The scope is an object, right? Which has things hanging off of it. In this case, it has name hanging off of it, the scope, and it actually that's it. It has name. Here, when I say foo, I'm within the context of this object, right? That I'm saying, get me the name, I get the name, and then I say, get me foo. It doesn't have foo, so it goes to the parent scope and gets foo from the parent. Prototype of one. Ah, exactly. Prototype, you see how important this stuff is, guys? This is why, I'm, ah, this is why I spent so much time talking to you guys about JavaScript and all of those intricacies, because once you understand prototypal inheritance, you understand lambda, all of this makes sense. Because you know how this works. You know it. All what happens is this object that is in this scope has a proto-reference to the object above it. And so when I ask for name, it has it. When I ask for foo, it doesn't. It goes to the parent, to its prototype, and gets it. I'll prove it to you. Let's, instead of doing scope.$parent, which we know is the dollar root scope, that's true, right? Let me instead compare its underscore, underscore, ah, ah, uh, uh, okay, hang on, that's up, okay, dot, dot, underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore, true, we have a proto, right? so, guys, by default, whenever you create a scope that's inside of another scope, it has a proto reference to the parent scope, We'll see how with directives you can turn that off, but for now, that's it. So that means if you have a controller, right, that does a bunch of stuff, and then inside of that HTML you have another controller, what you have is a controller that controls this scope, a controller that controls that scope, and then the root scope, right? So that's three levels. What, means, what that means is that this scope has a proto-reference to the parent scope, which has a proto-reference to its parent scope. And that's how you can inherit data from parent scopes in Angular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It's now 11 o'clock. Relax, go to the bathroom, whatever, and let's come back here in about 10 minutes. But before you go, does anyone have a phone? Uh, or a camera? Camera. Anyone? No one has a... Ah, here we go. My phone broke. Okay,
Chosen. Verstappen. Ça me donne une question. Ça Ich habe einen Projekt aus dem Land. 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 Ich habe einen Also make it as a top as well. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yes, yes, Ich habe das Gefühl, dass ich das Und 
So we talked about controllers. We talked about which, which are the things that basically control the dollar scope, right? And dollar scope is that thing that basically holds your data or your arm. Right? Uh, we talked about value, which is just a simple way to just place anything you want by name, so you can then inject it into your functions. It's it's basically a way to avoid global variables. Within even if it's within here, it's still kind of global to your entire application. So instead, to sort of keep it nice and packaged up, you might want to put it into, you might want to register it, if you will, with Angular, and then just eject it into your controllers or your directives uh, later on. Uh, the next thing we're going to learn about are what are known as factories. So notice the syntax is exactly the same. So you say the module name, factory, the name of your factory, and the function that actually performs the task. Same syntax, 
except we say factory instead of control. <coughs> okay, so what does a factory do? So, by the way, there's also a thing called a service in, in Angular. Factories and services in Angular are basically the same thing. They behave slightly differently um, in a sense that the, the syntax that you use to create it is different, but it is the same thing. If you get, okay, so let me tell you what it is and you'll see how it's the same thing. Thank you. So what a factory does is it returns an object. Okay, that's it. That's all a factory does, is it creates an object. Now the nuance here is that it will return only one instance of that object ever. It's a singleton. How many people here know what a singleton is? Oh, all right, a few of you. Good, good, good. Okay, a singleton means that you only have one instance of that object. Okay, that is a, a single instance, okay, a single pin. Okay. So even if we, call, we were to require or inject this uh, factory into like 50 different controllers, all of them would get the same exact object. Okay, so this object would only get created one time. What can we put in this object? Whatever we want. That's the cool part. Okay, so in this case, suppose you have lots of utility methods. Okay, where do you put your utility methods? Um, if I want to have a function which is going to take a string and reverse it and return the, the, the inverted version, suppose I need to use that all over my code. Right? One option is to repeat it in everywhere where I need it. But that's bad, right? We want to write it once and reuse it all the time to minimize the code base. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, what you can do is you can create a factory called, let's say, my utilities. Create an object, add all the utility functions that you want, and then just inject that into your controller and then call those utility functions relative to that object. So, what do I mean by all this talking? We have a factory that will return an object that has a reverse function. It takes an, a string and reverses that string and returns the reverse version. We then have a controller. That controller asks for a dollar scope. That gets injected. My value, which is world, the string world. And then it asks for my factory. What it gets from my factory is this object here. Okay? So, now that we have it, what do we do in here? Well, for dollar scope, we add name. And the value for name is whatever we get for my value. Does anyone remember what my value was? World. Remember, I registered it all the way at the top. The very top. My value, world. The value of my value is world. So, my value, my value is world. Okay. Then what I do is I do dollar scope rev name, and I attach to it a function. This is the equivalent of a computed observable, if you guys remember this. Whenever you attach a function to your, um, to your scope, and you read from it, it's treated as a computed observable. It's kind of the same thing. Um, so this function will get re-executed every time data within dollar scope is modified. Okay, and what does this function do? Well, it references, watch this, so this was the, the factory that I created, right? What it does, it does my factory dot reverse. That's this function here. It calls it with scope dot name. So what it and it returns that. So it takes whatever the value of name is, reverses it, and returns it. So if here I were to type hello world, here I get the reversed version of that. So, okay, so all a factory is, is just a place where you can put lots of logic that you want to reuse across components. So you can inject the same factory into lots of different controllers and reuse these methods every, all over your code. Uh, anyone got oh, what are you asking? How much it? How did it happen? Got some money. Check check lose got some money. Check check. Oh check. Are we should check? 
Definitely yes. Uh -huh. no, I'll tell you why. Because uh, there's a module that does uh, like bootstrap, um, bootstrap modal dialogues that you can include. And it's actually a factory, it's a service. So you inject it into your controller, you might know about it, and then you call it and it opens the dialogue. So yes, absolutely, of course. Yeah. Um, other questions? Simple, right? Okay, so we have value, where we can just store any value that we want. We have controllers, which control scope. We have filters, which allow you to transform data when it's rendered, right, using that pipe syntax. Uh, and we have factories where you can just put whatever you want. Now here's uh, a, one piece of nuance, actually a few. First, you should never put any user interface stuff inside of your controller. Your controller should never know about the DOM. No jQuery, no document, .get elements, but none of that. None of that goes in here. All of that goes into directives, which we'll discuss soon, or possibly services and factories. Mostly directives. Second thing, I, I told you guys that you could, from dollar scope, do something like dollar parent and get access to your parent scope, or do there's also I think dollar children where you can get access to your child scopes. Don't do that. Interprocess AI interprocess intercontroller communication. So communication between controllers should never be done explicitly. The reason for this is because suppose you have five controllers. And in your application, you structure it so that you put a controller here, and then inside of that, you put another controller. Now, in this code, you can say, okay, get me the parent and get access to this, right? But controllers are meant to be reusable. Controllers are meant to be moved around. So what happens if you take a controller that has a reference to the parent, assuming it's going to be this, and instead instantiate it over here? Errors. So your code, your, your controller, should never explicitly reference another controller. Instead, the way controllers can communicate with each other is by using a factory. So here's what you do. You create a factory which gets injected into two controllers. Okay? So you require the factory, just like this, you require your factory inside of my scope and then some other controller. And then what happens is if you want to communicate with other controllers, you write, remember, my factory is a singleton. There's only one instance. So the object that this controller gets is the same object that this controller gets. So that means here you can write to that same factory, the same object, and have that raise events that then this one can listen to and then update and do whatever it wants. So instead of speaking directly from one controller to another, you speaks through a factory. Does that make sense? Same thing with directives, by the way, which we'll get to later. But no two pieces of this puzzle should ever directly interact with each other. They should always be go through some level of indirection. What scope is it in? It's not in any scope. It's not attached. So scope implies that it's attached to this guy. It's not attached to this at all. It's injected as an, as an additional argument to your controller. It's just an argument. The steps of Malikas does, within any, any, within any controller or any directive, you can reference a factory. How does that sound? Okay. Okay, so here's what he's saying. He's saying, okay, we went through all this trouble of doing that, right? When we could have just done var my value equals well, gotten rid of that, not injected anything here, and everything will continue to work exactly the same. Absolutely. The difference, though, is that with this, you've effectively created a, scope, uh, a variable that is global to your entire application scope. And for the same reason, while global scopes are dangerous in the 
global global scope, like the real global scope, they're also dangerous for the same exact reason within this. Dangerous how? Well, okay, you're not going to get collisions because you're smart and you understand you're not going to reuse that variable name in other places. So you're not going to get collisions. Fair enough. But think of, it, think of it this way. When you're debugging code, if I create, give you a function that was this big and it had a variable in it, it's pretty easy to debug that function because you see the value of that variable and you go, oh, okay, I get every value, everything that can happen to that variable is very clear to me. And you can really understand the logic and debug it cleanly. The moment this then now references something outside of it, you now introduce the whole, because now in addition to this function, you have to look at all the other functions that might have modified that, that variable. Yeah? So now suddenly debugging, so the, the notion of having small scopes when dealing with variables is very important for debuggability and testability, actually. Did, did I answer your question? Other questions? Yes. personally just implemented. The idea is this. Okay, let me give you another scenario, okay? Suppose in your controller, instead of just getting a value and hard coding it, you want to go to a server and communicate with the server and get some data. Okay, so you're doing an HTTP get, you're getting data so you can attach it to your scope. One way to do it is to put all of that HTTP AJAX call all in here. But what might happen is you might have two different controllers that control the scope in different ways that are both trying to talk to the server, right? So rather than repeating code or having server code mixed in with your scope logic or your controller logic, what you may want to do is to put all the code that deals with talking to the server, all the AJAX stuff, inside of a factory, and then just eject it here, and instead of calling uh, reverse, call like get person data. And then have that go to the server, get that data, and then give it to you. And all of the complexity of going to the server, doing the AJAX, is inside of here. And all this does is uses the data that comes back and controls it. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can separate the code that talks to the server by putting that in the factory from the part that controls the data, which is the part that deals with the control. Strings have a reverse function natively, okay? But um, arrays. Sorry, arrays do. I'm sorry. Arrays do. Arrays do. So name is a string, which we tokenize by a blank by nothing. So it turns, you know, A, B, C the string into A, B, C, array. Once you have that array, you can then call reverse on it, which returns to an array in the opposite direction, right? So C, B, A. And then you can call join on an array. This is just JavaScript, by the way. This has nothing to do with Angular. And then you can call join, and join can take the value that you want to put in between the values. I think by default it's common. And so here I'm saying put no, nothing between, so it joins them and you get CBA as a string, and that is the string that is returned. It's just an algorithm to reverse the string, guys. That's all it is. Okay? It's just JavaScript. It's nothing to do with Angular. <coughs> Ah, uh, uh -huh. uh, 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 uh,
is also. Okay? Imam, yes, the Rabbanam, it's Rabbanam, red name, it's Rabbanam, Sakagarchi, so. John, Shazila, Kurish. Syntax. I think so. I don't remember the service syntax. Okay, fine, 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 fine. fine. Okay, so fine. The difference with Angular JS yes, service. Yeah, kind of mega syntax. I think in fact, we have a small object. So the same can be then what sort of this diet object. So that's me into a nuance card. The service here? Service is more vulnerable. That's exactly what I'm saying. Single 
Yes, factory uh, But great questions. This is very challenging. I like it. Um, what else? Nothing. Good. All right. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. All right. Let's get into directives. So, what are directives? So, I like to introduce directives with this example. I invented it. Okay, yes, Steph says he does. So this is the power of directives. I think, I think this really describes what makes them so powerful. Is that it allows you to not only use the existing HTML tags that we all know, like input and A and image and all these things, you can make up your own tags. You can make up a Google Maps tag. You can make up a, a video, a webcam tag. You can make up lots of different tags, right? Um, so you can really extend the functionality that you get from a browser. Uh, so let me give you another demo. So this is the Google Maps demo. Uh, so here's the Google Maps, which is, uh, let me zoom out a bit. Okay. So it's, it's kept in sync with these coordinates. So this is the longitude, latitude, longitude, latitude, and this is where we are. We can also use this pump function. Let's see if we can find the current location. Let's see if this works. It might take a while. Your internet sucks. <laughs> okay, eventually I think it's going to come out. You are in Boston. I'm not in Boston. Try, try, try. It's your shot that way. I can also change. No, I'm in Tourism. Anyway, the point is you can also modify things here. And it actually updates the map here. I think we're in the middle of the ocean right now. Anyway, you get the idea. So you can build these sort of reusable components with Angular. Okay? So the question is, how do you go about doing this? So we can study these more complicated examples in a bit. So first, let's look at a very simple example just to get our hands dirty. So let's look at this very simple example. So in this example, uh, we create a module. Oh, zoom. Okay. Never once seen it? How about now? People in the back? No. David, you can see it? I read it. Yeah. So, so. Alright. So here, we've seen how we can register values, no problem. We've seen how we can register a factory which just returns an object with a bunch of stuff in it. Okay? So that's that. Here we're registering a controller which controls the scope. Right? And in this scope, we're storing my value, which is world, and then rev name. So far, this is the exact same example that we had before. Right? Then we have our directive, and this is where the fun begins. So here, we're creating a directive that I'm calling hello world. Now, notice the syntax. Hello world. It's camel case. Right? Hello world. Pay attention to that. The reason for this is because when we use this in the HTML, camel case turns into dash notation. So when we use this in the HTML, we're going to say hello dash world. Okay? I actually spent maybe two, three hours trying to debug, trying to figure out why my code was not working, until I realized that I can't just use hello world in HTML, I have to use hello dash world. So I just saved all of you guys three hours of work. You're welcome. <laughs> Alright, so, uh, so the directive is going to return an object, okay? The object will have a, potentially, a template. So a template is HTML that you want to inject into your component. 
So if you're writing, I don't know, uh, a webcam, or you're, no, you're writing, I don't know, what can you build? A form. You want to build a reusable form, okay? The, co the HTML code, the visual part of your component, would go somewhere in here. Now you can do this in two ways. You can either say template and specify your HTML as a string, okay? You can also do template URL and specify a reference to the template, which can be stored separately. What I encourage you guys to do is always keep your HTML separate from your JavaScript, separate from your CSS. But when you are actually going to deploy your code, there is a compiler that will actually take, it will resolve the template URL for you, get it, turn it into a string, and inject it in there as a template. Okay. No, sorry. So there's that compiler, and then there's another compiler that will just, so this template, uh, if you do template URL, it looks it up in a cache. It will pre-populate the cache separately. So long story short, I encourage you guys, whenever you write code like this, don't do that. Just do template URL. Put it in a separate file. I put it here just to make it easier to read. That's all. Okay, so what is my template? So I have a field set, a legend, and then an input of type text. That's it. Okay? That's all I have. And then you call, you have a late function. Now a late function, unlike, remember when we were discussing controllers, we said you could specify what you want injected into your controllers. You can have scope or root scope or whatever. These variables are not up to you. Okay? The first one is always going to be scope. The second one is always going to be the element. The element on which either your tag or the element on which you added the attribute. It's always going to be that. And this one is always going to be uh, an object which has all the attributes of that element. Okay. This is, I think, I haven't looked at the code, but I think it's the equivalent to calling dot data in, J in uh, jQuery. I think it returns the same thing. Okay, so you have this link function. This is where you put the logic that is actually going to control your component. Okay. So this is a template that gets swapped into this element. And then this is the code that will control it. Okay. And scope, as you can imagine, is the scope in which this component exists. Okay. All right, so far so good. So what is our very basic simple component going to do? Or directive going to do? Well, it's going to create a update function, which will just find elm, which is that guy, dot find, by the way, notice, what does this look like to you? What, what syntax is this? JQuery. jQuery. So this L is actually a jQuery object. Okay? All right. So we do find. Look for the legend, which is going to be here. That's the legend. Okay? And then we're going to call dot text, which is going to set the inner text to whatever the value of name is attached to the scope. Okay? Let me remind you guys that name is specified here, right? Which initially was value, was world. So all this does is it will set the value of inside of legend to that. Now let's look at input though. So input on the other hand, we do ng model and we attach to name. And so here we can modify it. And this is what happens. Now There's a nuance here, guys. What this means is that this directive has an input that is bound to name. And when it's modifying name, it's actually modifying the name that's attached to the parent scope. Right? Okay. Update from 7 to SO. That's it? That's it. Can someone remind me what this does? Exactly. Whenever name attached to scope is modified, it will call this function. And what this function will do is it will read name from that scope and write it to the text in the legend. Similarly, you could have read, for example, longitude or latitude attached to the scope and update it in here instead of modifying the text of that, J of that uh, DOM object. Instead, you could have modified where the Google Maps is rendered. You guys see how that works? So you listen here and you update here. 
And all of this logic is encapsulated inside the directive. Initially, I don't profit to Java again. Exactly. Other questions so far? Um, a few nuances now. Okay, so watch this. So the point I made is that if the directive modifies values, it will actually modify directly that scope. In other words, scope is in here. This scope is actually the same scope as the, the scope that the directive lives in. Which is a problem because now if, if this directive is reusable and it modifies or adds some temporary values to the scope, it's actually modifying your data scope, the scope that your application is using. And that's a problem. Do you guys see how that's a problem? Let me say this one more time. You have a scope okay, where you have some data. Inside of that you have a directive. The directive is reusable. The directive may want to add some temporary variables, it may want to move things around or whatever within its scope. If it does that though, it's modifying the parent scope. And if you use that directive in lots of places, eventually you might end up modifying something and getting a collision with the parent controller. Do you guys see how that's possible? Okay. So, the question is how do you isolate from the parent scope? Well, one thing you can do is specify scope colon. By default, it's false. False means don't create another scope for me. Just use whatever scope I happen to live in. That's dangerous, again, because it can cause collisions. So what I can do is instead of false, I can say true. What does true mean? Well, if you guys remember, by default, a scope that is the child of another scope has a proto-reference to the parent. So what that means is that here, I'm still reading world from the parent scope, but when I modify it, I only modify it locally. What's happening here? So this scope is this. The rest of the scope is that. This has a proto-reference to that. Okay? Initially, this has a name, this does not. So initially, I read name, don't have it, come here, get name, and render name. But then when I modify it, when I start typing, I'm modifying name of this object. And so this object modifies and this stuff updates, but the global scope does not update because I'm modifying a different scope. You guys see that? Okay. So that's one way. But the thing is, if I get rid of this, uh, so I've just written an empty string, but if I were to, let's say, delete this value, what value would I get back? if I read it again. World. Why? Because if I delete name from here, the next time the read comes, it'll say there is no name, go to the next one, and get world from here. And that can cause confusion. Right? So the question is, how do you completely isolate the directive so that it can be reused everywhere? So that you know people at like Google, for example, can write a directive, create a library, and have that library seamlessly work with all your applications, without possibly modifying your scope. How do you do this? Okay, so here's how you can do that. My favorite way to do this is you specify an object, and then you specify explicitly the attribute that you want it to be mod to modify. What, does, what did I just do here? What does this mean? This means something really cool. What this means is that this scope is completely a separate scope it does not have a proto-reference to any parent. It lives in its own island. But, and here's the cool part, but whenever you read name or write to name, only then does it actually modify the parent scope. Okay. So here, Hello world. Okay, so notice the syntax here. So I created a div, and here I created data hello dash world. If I did this, it would not work. See, it's not there. So you have to do data dash world. Okay, so that is the same thing as that.
So now, let's get rid of that. What we can do, I think, oh man, now I suddenly forgot the syntax. Okay, so I think I do, uh, let's search, uh, name is, yeah, okay. I forgot how to pass in. Does anyone remember how to pass in these values? Just take it. Just take it, OK, good. Oh, that's nice. Name is name. Oh, good. Hey, now, well done. OK, good, 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 good. OK, so now here's what's happening, guys. Look. Let's say, I know this looks weird because it looks like name is name, but let's have name be foo. Let's go into our directory and call it foo. Then you use uh, foo everywhere. Show me that. Uh, Did you mention? Scope name. Very long. Ah, I got it. Just take this. That's what I meant. Wait, no. Oh, the fun of writing code on the spot. Okay, hang on. So what this means is this, guys, look, is that this scope can give a variable whatever it wants, or the, the attribute name, whatever it wants, and say, have the user who's using my directive specify the attribute that they want to be this. And now the directive that you write one time can be used with different models. Why? Because suppose you called your longitude lon. But in my model, I called it longitude. So what I would do is I would do lon equals longitude. And now you would be reading my longitude with lon. This is actually how the Google Maps example works. If you go back to Google Maps, uh, this is the video, this is the maps. Uh, here, look. I have lat that is equal to something and lng, longitude, which is equal to something. When I use it, Ah, here we go, here we go. Data lat is, e is equal to the attribute latitude. Data lng is equal to longitude. And it, and it just works. Does Guman want your bottom box up from the Kinetic. Okay, so this is what allows you to mean that this saw saw I for make all things saw. They have a In other words, it allows us to map this attribute, which is in my model to the local property or local attribute that the directive is using. Again, because a directive was written by one person to be reused by lots of different people. And different people might have called longitude different names. Some people might call it long, longitude, x, right? You can call it different things, but it all means the same thing. So how do you write a directive that you can reuse over and over again, don't, no matter what the name is? Is you allow them to create this mapping in their HTML. Okay, good question. So there's also uh, the, uh, the big A, the Google, you know, you will mention at Google.com. At, yeah, the big A. Weird, yeah. 
So you can specify that thing. And what that thing allows you to do is it allows you to bind to an expression. In other words, here you can actually do something like um, something like that, and then you can specify that like that, I think. So there's there's that, and there's one more which I can't. Does anyone remember the third one? There are three of them. And ampersand. That's right. The ampersand, which I think is used for referencing functions. In, but I have to say, personally, I always just use the equal sign because it seems to take care of everything I want. I know that I can use this and I know that I can use the ampersand, but almost every directive I've ever written just uses this and I'm done. So, it depends. So, this is the most important one, so this is the one I want everyone to know. The rest you can kind of read about later if you want. Questions so far? By the way, these examples are online, right? So you guys can actually, if you want to actually see how I did like the video one or how the Google Maps one works, just go in, read the code, it's very simple. Director, it's okay, so routing. So the last thing we're going to talk about is, we have three minutes. We're going to talk about routing in Angular. So again, remember when we talked about backbone, we talked about this notion of having routing, even though it's a single page application? And all routing means is maintaining a link between the URL that you have in your address bar and the state of your application. Why would you want this? Well, maybe you want to copy that link and send it to a friend and have them go to the same state. Or you yourself want to remember where you were. You want to bookmark it or whatever. Right? It makes sense to have the two in sync. So the question is, how can you do something like this? So here's a very basic application. So um, I can add phone numbers. There's no validation, whatever. I can specify if it's a you know mobile or home. I can add it, and it gets added here. I can then click more, and it gets routed. Notice the route actually changes. It goes to slash phone slash the ID of the thing that I'm rendering, which in this case is this, which has this number and this phone. I can hit the backwards button, and it goes back a page. I can hit forward. I can back. By the way, backward and forward. What data structure is used? What data structure is used to implement backward and forward, or undo and redo, or stack? You have a stack here. You have a stack here. As you go forward, you push things onto the stack. If you want to go back, you pop it off. You push it onto the undo stack. If you want to undo, you push it off. You put it onto the redo stack. If you want to redo, you pop it off. You put. It you get it? Good. Okay. So. The question is, how do you get this kind of functionality in AngularJS? So, um, oh man, I forgot to, one second. Alt. Alt. Here we go, here we go. Oh, size, here we go. So let's have it be like 28. Oh, that's big. Oh, that's big. Okay, that's fine. So examples, AngularJS, route it. Okay, that's way too big. Sorry, just one second. What's a good size? Someone guess. How's that? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, good. Okay, so this is my the, the HTML for my routing application. So I have a header where, remember, put all your CSS in a head, right, at the top. Um, and then, in, this is very bad, don't do that. <laughs> Always keep your CSS in a separate CSS file, right? You guys know this. Um, so this is using a, an HTML5 tag. If you don't know what the header is, just assume it's a div. So I have a div here that inside has Angular example. This is like going to be at, my top, at the top of my application. I have a footer which will have, you know, some footer information. And then there's the part that's in between my application that's actually going to change. So that part, the part that's actually going to change, is specified by this attribute, ng view. Okay? So the content of this div, this is where all my routes are going to get rendered in here. Okay? Ng view. Okay. Then we put our script stuff at the bottom. Why do we put scripts at the bottom? For performance. 
parts. That's right. Because remember, uh, script, when it starts loading, it freezes the rendering. So if you put it at the top, you're going to see nothing. You're going to see a blank screen for a long time until the script actually loads, and then it will render. And that doesn't make for a very good user experience. So put your scripts at the bottom so that the user at least sees something. Maybe even a loader. That's OK. But then, then your script loads, and everything happens. OK. So we're uploading jQuery, Angular, and another module. OK, so this is something new that we haven't studied yet. I mentioned to you guys that in Angular, you can have other modules right? that you can reuse when you create yours. In this case, in order to do routing, you actually have to use a different module. So you have to actually go download the code, a separate module, bring it in, and actually load it. Okay? Once you have that, so once you have Angular and routing, now you can do routing. So what does the code for my routing look like? Well, first of all, I wrap everything in a closure. Why do I wrap everything in a closure? Avoid global variables. <laughs> Say it out loud, that's okay. All right, then I have some data, which is an object that has numbers. And it's just an array of phone numbers, each of which has an ID and a type. Is it a mobile phone number? Is it a home phone number? Then I do what we know I do, which is I create a module. But look, here I'm doing something very different that we, we haven't really seen before. Instead of assigning this to a variable and then doing variable dot whatever and then variable dot whatever, I'm doing something similar to what we did with jQuery. I'm using chaining syntax. I'm calling this and just doing dot controller, dot controller. You can do that. And since we know jQuery and we studied how chaining works in jQuery, Angular allows you to do the same exact thing. I remember at one point one of you guys asked, oh, is this a common pattern now to do chaining? Yes, it is. D3 uses it, Angular uses it, jQuery uses it, and lots of other libraries use it as well. So hopefully you guys were here for that talk. Okay, so what do we do? So we register a controller, we give it the name, and then we give it the function. But we give it as an array. Why do we pass an array? For minimization and performance, that's right. So we explicitly say this is what we want. And this is just a local variable that we happen to use. We could have called it George. It would still work. OK, so what do we do? So to that scope, we attach numbers. And then we attach an add function. Uh, all the add function is going to do is it going, it's going to push the newly added phone number onto my array. By the way, this stuff here, all this code, of the form that allows you to do it, any validation, it's the same code as the one that we looked at that did to do. Do you guys remember the to do example? Same thing. It's the same code. Yeah, I copied and pasted. Okay, so we got that. Then we create a set. So this is a nuance. We create a second controller. A second controller is used to, re to, re to actually render the details about one phone number. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, in our routes, what we're going to do is we're going to say, from our route params, we're going to get the phone ID. Let's jump ahead to understand how we got here. Just like you can do dot controller or dot value or dot directive, you can also do dot config. Dot config is what you do in order to specify your configuration. This is the code that will run before the rest of Angular runs. This is like your setup code. Okay? So here, what I do is I inject dollar route provider. Okay? This is the name. This is the local variable. Dollar route provider has the some of it has others, but these are the main functions. It has a when function, and it has an otherwise function. How does this work? Well, when the pattern in the URL matches this, do that. When it matches this, do that. Where else have we seen this before? Backbone. Backbone, exactly. When we studied routing in Backbone, it was the same thing. The difference is, is in Backbone, we gave a function as the second argument. So we said route, function, route, function. Here we're saying route, but then we're giving this object. And what does this object have? Let's take a look. So this object has a template URL, which is the HTML that's going to get rendered inside of that view when you're in this route. And then we specify a controller. This is the controller that is going to sit at the root of that HTML. OK? okay. So. 
we give it two routes. One which will render all the phone numbers. The second route will render one phone number with whatever ID is specified here. This syntax means passing whatever variable you want. This is a variable. And then, otherwise, we're going to redirect, so if you type in anything else, we're going to redirect you back to phones and show you the list of phones. Okay? Very simple, right? Okay, so now that you understand this part, and you understand that this variable is called phone ID, let's go back here. Route params dot phone ID. Okay? So we're getting the value of this variable from the URL, and we're returning it here, and we're adding it to our scope. Then what we do is we loop over our phone numbers, looking for the phone number that has that ID. And when we find it, we set that as the phone attribute of, dollar, of the local scope. Okay. So now, let's look at what the HTML will look like for this page. One second. Phone details. Here we go. So here, we're going to say... We're inside a phone, right? So a phone has a phone ID, which we render here. Sorry, the scope has a phone ID that we attached. But also, phone has a value, and phone has a type. And all we do is we render these inside of this route. That's it. And as for the list, phone uh, list. Well, again, we have a repeater that will repeat over every phone number and it will render the value of the phone number, and it will render the ID of the phone number. And then it will have a phone, like a more hyperlink. And look at this, look at this. So the way I implemented the hyperlink is when you click on it, I go to this route, hash, slash, and then this path. And which route will match this path? Well, let's go back to our uh, route. See that? So this will match whatever is this, and whatever ID we get from the current number will go into here and get passed along to the handler, which will read the ID, get the data, add it to the scope, and render in the partial. That's it. How does that count? Questions? Get to the instrument. Get to the instrument. Yeah. Uh, template URL, I see. Oh, template URL. Oh, but it's template URL and Misha for Dolly said, borrow template URL, test set on the directive image. So whenever it reads template URL from anywhere, it always goes through a cache that it has locally. So if the next time it goes to the route, it's not going to do another get, obviously. But the second thing, again, is there are compilers that will pre-populate the cache for you in code. And then you can serve out that stuff so that you don't have to keep making trips to the server. You have all your templates there on the client. I'll get us see. Joe, John, Raymond, Joe, Vavar, Nori, Shama, Tassin. By the time you make any AUA, you might as well check it out. Tassin, Medzian, Dalija. You have to ask him if he wants to do it. Let's go. Vavar, Kosar. Oh, yeah, it's in the main building, I think. Yeah, the security will tell you, if you don't know where it is. It's the big concert hall. I, I've never been to it, but apparently it's very pretty. Um, tomorrow we will discuss... Uh, we did I get, No. No JS tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow. Good job, guys.